Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals. Welcome to the Safer Chemicals Podcast. My name is Päivi Jokiniemi, and in the studio with me is Erik van der Plasche, the chair of our Biocidal Products Committee. Today we'll go through the main topics of the June committee meeting, covering, for example, the topical active substance and union authorization cases. But we'll also take a broader look at the work of the committee and save some time to hear Eric's reflections on how it has developed during the past 10 years. So welcome back, Eric. Hello, good Good, to see you. Good to have you with us again. If we start by taking us back to the meeting that just ended yesterday, Um, You had some administrative issues and work program related topics on the agenda. And from that, I'd like to start the issue of data that is generated after an active substance has been approved. Uh, The agency had prepared a document on this and that was used for the committee to agree on how this kind of data should be submitted, evaluated and published. Did you reach an agreement on this? Yes, uh, Pai, yeah, indeed, we had this document on our agenda. And uh, first of all, we reached an agreement on the document. So that's good. That uh, was a second discussion. And uh, now we can finalize it and publish it on our, on our website. And it has to do with data on an active substance, which is submitted during a product application. So by then somebody's interested in placing a product on the market, but he might need some further data on the active substance to be able to pass, for example, a certain exposure scenario in terms of risks, be it environment, be it uh, human health. And we agreed now on a procedure which will need to be used. So how the data will need to be submitted, uh, will we uh, look at it in working groups and when, uh, in the end there will be a need for the committee to take a decision on let's say, what the uh, the evaluation of the data and the end result of it, which will be published, is in it what we call a list of endpoints. So the whole procedure is now fixed and clear. It's relevant for national as well as for union authorization. So both processes are, are impacted. And uh, yeah, we're very happy with that because this was an issue which is already pending for quite some time. So it's now good to see that everything is uh, is there. And the the main challenge of the whole thing is that uh, it will need to be finalized within the evaluation phase for a union authorization. So before the evaluate the CA submits the draft opinion to the agency. So there is some time pressure over there. But on the other hand, it's you do n- not look at a lot of data. It's limited to a certain a certain package. Uh, yeah, the the applicant needs to fulfill the requirements. So does this mean any big changes for companies or or for the authorities? No, it doesn't mean that there are big changes. It's more that the process is now clear on how we deal with the data which can be submitted during a product authorization on an active substance. So there's still some issues around it, for example, uh, letters of access or access to the data. Uh, or how do you involve the different parties involved, which might go from an authorization holder to a a company who's an owner of the data for the active substance. But that will be, we think, let's say, first of all, solved in the light of experience. And there's some discussion which will take place still at the the, uh, CA meeting on a more regulatory level. And that's more on letters of access and access to the data. Was there some other um, topics there, work program uh, topics that you want to mention? Yeah, that's the the usual topics we have on work program. So we looked at what will we have this year and uh, the numbers are now clear. We will have uh, yeah less than last year. That's, of course, uh, disappointing for a chair and also for the commission that we uh, we submit uh, a bit lower than we expected in our in our work program. So that's true for union authorization as well as for active substances. So in total, we'll have something like, I think, 30 to 35 opinions, uh, something like 10 to 15 for the review program, and the same for for union authorization. But it's good that, uh, yeah, it's clear what's now coming uh, after the summer so that uh, everyone can prepare for that. Okay, good. Um, If we leave that topic and go to the active substance approvals. Uh, You went through three applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, What would you like to highlight from them? 
Yeah, they were, they were not so difficult. Uh, so we also dealt with them in uh, not that much time, let's say, not that many comments. Um, all adopted with a uh, yeah, consensus opinion on uh, approving these active substances. So I can run them through in short. So the first one was, uh, was garlic uh, extract, which is no longer called garlic extract. We decide on the new name for this uh, substance. Uh, because it's not an extraction, but it's another process to to uh, produce this uh, this active substance, and it's used to uh, deter cats. So it's a cat repellent. So there will be a redefinition. That's maybe interesting to mention that there is will be the possibility for another applicant to take over the extract, uh, but this one, uh, yeah, will be uh, probably approved by the commission. Uh, maybe also interesting to mention that it's not uh, meeting the criteria for Annex 1 inclusion. You may expect that for uh, yeah, a natural substance like a, a garlic, but uh, it's still classified for sensitizing uh, properties. So the Annex 1 refers to those that... Uh... That refers to the lower risk uh, substances. So substances which are not classified and are then subject to what is called the uh, simplified uh, procedure. Right. And then to the other active substance approval yeah, cases. Yeah, we had Velarchia, a microorganism, an amoeba, um, which was proposed to be not approved, where Malta was the evaluating CA. So the first dossier we had for Malta, so that's good. Yeah, and th there's a story behind this because we already adopted an opinion in the past on, uh, on Velarchia. But the applicant uh, came back, the, the industry, and uh, they applied again with some additional data on this. But still, our conclusions uh, did not change. So uh, for different reasons, for example, there are doubts about the efficacy. There are doubts about the effects on human health, which is called uh, yeah, a Trojan horse effect that the amoeba might take with it Legionella bacteria, and that might lead to, let's say, unwanted uh, effects. So there are several reasons for, for which we uh, decided in the past uh, to not approve the substance. So that was confirmed uh, again. And now, uh, yeah, this will go again to the commission and they will again have to take this non-approval uh, non decision. Yeah, and then the last one we had was an, uh, a disinfectant, uh, KMPS, a uh, long name, pentapotassium bisperoxymonosulfate, which was approved for prototype 2, 3, 4 and 5. So not a lot of debate and discussions around it. Maybe to mention that it is renamed, so there's another name for this, but uh, everybody knows it in the market as KMPS, so that's the most easy name to use. Slovenia did the evaluation, very good. So yes, yeah, this, uh, this is a, uh, the recommendation is approved, so that will, uh, will, will for sure be taken over by the Commission. Before we uh, go through the union authorization applications, I noticed that on the agenda, you also had this discussion on the working procedure for minor and major change applications mm -hmm. related to union authorizations. Could you tell us more about these applications and will there be some changes to how they are processed? Yeah, yeah these, these are new processes for the committee. And for major change, so this is a change on uh, if you already have an authorization for a bicycle product or a bicycle product family, and you want to change that uh, that authorization by having, for example, uh, more users included, uh, or other target organisms uh, for which the the product uh, will be used, or you want to replace a coformulant by another coformulant which is a less hazardous profile, for example, or different properties you need. And then you can apply for either a major change or a minor change. And that depends on uh, what kind of changes is, is, uh, is foreseen. And for major change, we already had a procedure and we came up, let's say, with a revised procedure. We made it more simple and we, uh, well, we had some changes which were needed in terms of the use of our internal systems for communication, etc. So that went easily through, uh, but that procedure will uh, now again be published on uh, on our website. And the new element was this minor change where we also have now received uh, already uh, some applications. And in the legislation, let's say there is some 
unclarity, there was at least unclarity on does the committee need to deliver an opinion on a minor change or can it be an ECA decision? And in the end, that was now clarified. It means that the committee will have to deliver an opinion on uh, what is called minor changes. That means we will have to uh, come up also over there with a procedure. It's a very short uh, process of 90 days in which we have to do the evaluation and the adoption of the, of the opinion. So we look to uh, a written adoption procedure where ECHA will, uh, will do the work and the committee, of course, need to discuss and agree on it. So we presented this process, this procedure that it will come to the to the committee. We have something like uh, six uh, applications in the in the backlog, let's say. So it was good to see that the committee, of course, they had several questions on this new work stream for them. But in the end, we agreed on this process, this procedure, and now we, as an agency, will start implementing it. And then uh, after the summer, we will start to adopt uh, opinions. Do you expect that this would um, make the workload of the committee much higher? or In, in the future, yes, I think, because uh, companies are always changing their, pro- their products. That's what we, we know from, uh, let's say, from, yeah, for, for example, from member states who have a national system or from, of course, just talking to, to, to companies. So it happens a lot. And the more union authorizations we will grant, the more minor and major changes we will see. So I do expect indeed it may be not next year, but the years after that, at a certain point of time, this will be a significant workload for the committee. So clearly impacting the work. Yeah, sure. Uh, What about then the union authorization applications this time? Yeah, we had two. One of them based on lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide, uh, very straightforward, not that much to mention. Uh, the only thing, of course, that we agreed on the on the authorization, at least again, on the recommendation to it, so that we will finalize. Um, the other one was a bit more complex in a sense that there was a co-formulant which sparked uh, quite some uh, quite some discussion. Yeah, maybe what I wanted to say about that is that, uh, let's say that there was a discussion on adverse effects which this uh, co-formulant may may bring, um, where at, at, let's say, at scientific level, we couldn't fully agree or, no, let's put it in other words, we couldn't fully conclude. So there was still some doubts, some uncertainties. And then the working group concluded, well, we can be sure about uh, short-term risk, but not so much about long-term risks. And yeah, that sparked quite some debate. And uh, does it now meet the conditions of of the legislation? Because that be that needs to be safe for human health and environment. So in the end, we, we, we concluded on that. But yeah, the message is that sometimes we have difficulties to to come to a final conclusion based on the information we have and the uncertainties we have. But we still need to come to a conclusion on whether we recommend authorization. So it's not so easy sometimes for the recipient of the opinion, the commission, because there are some uncertainties in what we uh, what we bring to them. Uh, and I think in the end, we all have to deal with these uncertainties, and but still move forward. And that requires sometimes some, let's say, some flexibility and some pragmatism. Then we have talked several times about the comparative assessment of anticoagulant rodenticides in this podcast. Um, To close the circle, uh, in this meeting you gave one final opinion related to this topic, in particular on the question related to whether anticoagulants could be ranked based on their risk profiles. Mm -hmm. So in practice you were asked to consider if one of them would be less harmful to people, animals and the environment than another. Uh, what happened with this request? Yeah, that uh, that's a, indeed exactly the question we, we had to look at. For this one, ECA, so us as an agency, we acted as the rapporteur, so we did a lot of work in looking into the, the hazard profile of these uh, active substances. In total, it's seven or eight AVK uh, rodenticides. Um, we looked at classification, we looked at PBT properties, we looked at ED properties, if information was available. We even went as far as uh, looking at uh, data from poison centers, so in uh, in member states, whether there are 
indications that a biocidal product containing a certain uh, active leads to uh, yeah more let's say cases compared to another which was in the end very difficult to use because you it's difficult to relate them to sales figures and you do not have the same data in each member state or differently structured so in the end, uh, what happened, we, we couldn't make a distinction between uh, between these active substances in terms of uh, risk profile or hazard profile. You have this distinction between first generation and second generation uh, anticoagulants, where for human health, it was not possible to make a distinction at all. For environment, there was this idea that uh, second generation have a uh, let's say a more worse profile compared to the first generation, but to rank them with between all these different uh, seven or eight substances, that uh, that was also for the environment not possible. So in the end, we concluded we cannot rank, we cannot make a distinction. Although of course we know that all these uh, all these substances uh, they meet the exclusion criteria, so they have a, a dangerous profile. There was not that much discussion in the in the committee. It was already discussed in working groups, so everybody agreed with this uh, conclusion. So again, that will go to the commission, and for them, they will have to take a decision on what we uh, what we concluded. And this would then be the end of the process for the committee. For the comparative assessment, this uh, this is the end. So we had this uh, conclusion in November last year on the comparative assessment itself. We had this part of the work. And the commission will now need to draft a decision uh, for the, based on uh, the opinion we delivered. Draft in June, probably a decision in uh, after the summer. And uh, that will form the basis for uh, decisions to be taken by, uh, yeah, by national authorities based on uh, applications for product authorization. If we then leave the topical cases of this uh, meeting um, and take a little bit broader look at the work of the committee. At the end of last year, we announced that you will be stepping down as the chair of the Biosaddle Products Committee this summer. And this was, in fact, the last meeting you chaired. Yeah. So you've been chairing the Biosaddle Products Committee for 10 years now. Um, and we are, of course, all very eager to hear your reflections on this mm. time. How have you experienced these years? And could you tell us how the work has developed mm -hmm. during this time? Yeah, it's indeed, uh, this was my last meeting. So, uh, yeah, with pain in my heart, let's say I will leave this, uh, this committee after a period of uh, really enjoyed uh, working for, yeah, for this legislation, but also working with a... Uh, with this committee, we sometimes compared it with a uh, driving Rolls Royce and then trying to steer it into its uh, good direction. And maybe you, you can distinguish between uh, a couple of phases, as was also mentioned by, by some of the members. So we also look back in uh, a kind of little symposium after the last day in which we finalized all our opinions. And then we had half a day to look back at the last uh, 10 years. We started, of course, with the first phase, so setting up uh, the committee. We had to develop uh, processes and procedures, uh, rules of procedures, working instructions for the different processes. It was, of course, for everyone, it was new. So also uh, member states, they had to uh, think about who are we going to appoint or nominate for the VPC. And that is different compared to Rock and Siak, who were already there in the member state committee, but uh, Rock and Siak have a different uh, different structure. So member states had to appoint. It was, of course, a process which we uh, yeah, were very eager to see who will be nominated by uh, with the member states. It was good that we already had Rock and Siak. So when we set up the committee, we made use of the already existing structure and, and processes and procedure. For example, for the rules of procedure, we did a copy and paste and then adapted it to the uh, to the, the Barisada products uh, regulation. So that was the first, uh, well, first year. And then we started in 2014, having all the members there, having a chair there, me. And I think it was good also that I knew the old system and knew, let's say, what, uh, yeah, take some experience from the past and then try to use it to the best of the, our advantages for the for the future. 
And then we started with uh, with active substances. That uh, is maybe the second phase of uh, of the committee. As expected, let's say there were not that many other processes. They would kick in later. We started with, uh, let's say, uh, discussing uh, the first uh, draft opinions on an active substance uh, approval. And I can still remember, and that was also mentioned this week, that uh, yeah, in the beginning we debated a lot on uh, how would the opinion look like, uh, how does it need to be structured, how deep shall we go into the scientific content, but especially on what conditions are we going to propose to the commission when we approve or when we want to approve uh, and how should these conditions look like or do we have recommendations for an application for product authorization and how would we phrase it and and well that took some time uh, so the first uh, let's say drafts which came to us we didn't manage to adopt them in one meeting but uh, as we gained more and more experience we, we yeah we, it became let's say uh, more easy for the committee and also we came to a kind of structured way of working and we we simplified the way in which we uh, yeah phrased those conditions for approval but also for for product authorization and then we really uh, yeah speeded up in uh, in having opinions on active substances uh, and we became close to this number of uh, 50 per year which was a uh, yeah an expectation from the beginning that we would do this and then we would finalize the review program by 2024 and then maybe we go into the third phase which started around 2016 17 then we started first of all to work on other processes so union authorization started to kick in dispute settlement in the mutual recognition where we got a request from the commission also other requests which is called this article 75.g and we saw this decline in the in the active substance uh, approvals based on the uh, introduction of the of the uh, ed criteria and workload uh, issues, I think, at member state level. But we, so we increased in complexity and having more and more processes. Uh, I think a real milestone was our first uh, adoptions of the opinions for union authorization based on uh, on iodine and uh, iodate. And uh, yeah, now we are in 2023, we adopted close to 400 opinions. So that's really a lot. Now I think we are a full-grown uh, committee. It was, there was this reference made uh, also this week to starting as a baby committee and now we are adults. And I think that is true. We now are uh, a, a, yeah, a committee with a lot of experience dealing with, uh, with many different uh, processes and able to, to deliver the work which we need to do. Has there been a memorable moment, something that you would want to, to share at this point? Well, I, I think the, the, the most memorable moment still to me is indeed these first adoptions of the uh, opinions on, on union authorization. That's, that's really one where we were really excited on uh, this long expected uh, work stream. We had a lot of discussions also a bit over there on how the opinion would, need, would look like, how we would need to do it. And I can remember we still discussed uh, the day before with uh, the commission and with uh, the member state involved. It was the Netherlands. And we had some difficult technical discussions also. And we managed still to adopt it uh, during the week. And that, that was really uh, one of the, yeah, the best uh, things of the 10-year uh, history of the, of the committee. Very nice example. Um, having looked back, time to look forward. Is there anything that you'd like to highlight or emphasize now that you're leaving the committee and leaving the agency? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you see the future of the committee and the work? Well, let's let's first say indeed that if you look at indeed uh, we are an, an adult committee. There may be some other elements which you can add to that. For example, m most of our opinions are adopted by consensus. It's normal, it's real that you have somebody who disagrees so that we have this minority opinions. I think that's normal, but the majority should be consensus. So that's very good, uh, very good to see uh, that all our opinions are taken over by the commission. They are fit for purpose. So although lately we see that some opinions come back, but still 
I would say and that was also confirmed that uh, by the commission that there was there is this kind of rubber stamping of what we do and that was also the expectation and there's also the acceptability of stakeholders so they see the work which we are doing and I think we can conclude that uh, yeah that there is this let's say this acceptability they see this this adult committee let's say who is able to come to an, an informed uh, decision on what to do and also taking a decision in the timelines uh, in the timelines we have so which are sometimes really short and the, the real challenge was to always take a decision in one committee meeting because otherwise we do not fit in the the timelines we have and in the beginning that was maybe a bit scary but in the end uh, yeah we managed to uh, almost always accept there are some exceptions we take a decision in uh, in one meeting so we have a yeah, a dedicated committee, we have a group of members uh, from the member states with their alternates, with a team behind them, who have now a lot of experience in committee work. Uh, we have quite some expertise from different uh, different fields in the, in the committee. So I think, th and the foundation is there in terms of structure, in terms of organization. Our organization, I think, referring also to my colleagues, is close to perfection. So I think we are able to cope with what is uh, coming to us. And that might be a high, high workload, especially if you look indeed at minor changes, major changes and more union authorizations uh, which are coming. I would like to thank you, Eric, for joining us in the studio after each meeting since October 2021. I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of many others when I'm saying that it has been a great pleasure uh, to have you as our guest. And we've really appreciated getting this first-hand information from you. So I would like to wish you all the best for the future. And who knows where we will see and hear you next time. Thank you, Pauvi. It was really a pleasure to do this uh, postcard with you. So uh, also to the audience, it was really a pleasure to do. Thank you so much. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. If you want to listen to more episodes of Safer Chemicals podcast, you'll find them all on our website at eka.europa.eu forward slash podcasts. Safer Chemicals podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals.